Well, welcome. I'm going to take up our second part in becoming an overcomer. And as far as possible, if you'll join me, let's seek our Father in prayer. <clears throat> our most holy Father. I pray right now that you would send your angels, that they would dispel the darkness of the enemy. I pray, Father, for heaven to settle down in this room. And I pray, dear Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would do his mighty work of impressing upon our hearts the solemn message of the hour. Father, we've received the prophetic warning. We understand the imminent coming of Christ. Even the world itself sees this and the signs all about them. But the great work now is the work of preparing to meet with thy God. And my Father, I'm not fit. I'm not fit to give this message apart from Jesus at all. But I plead now for the powerful presence of your Holy Spirit to just flood my mind and my mouth and let me be slow to speak quick to hear, slow to wrath. Dear Father, I pray that you will bless my words, that they're yours. And I pray that the truth as you want it to come forward will do so now. And Father, I pray this believing, for I prayed it in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we be can you and I be expectant Christians? Are there things that, that we can count on? Things that we can say with certainty are going to be? Are there? There's a quote I want to read you real quick. Uh, it appears only four times in the Spirit of Prophecy, at least on the CD-ROM. I don't know about the new releases, but it's a term that seems like an oxymoron, but it comes to mind right now. We're talking about righteousness by faith. We're talking about becoming an overcomer. And if we were to list on the whiteboard every message that's been given on this subject, or every time righteousness by faith has been discussed, we would, we would not run out for the rest of our life of things to watch, listen to, and so forth. So I realize that I'm, I'm one of so many people that have come and are going to stand before God's people and talk about righteousness by faith. But I also recognize that on the priest's garment, there were 12 stones, and were those stones all the same color? No, and, and they represent the 12 tribes of God's people. They represent the entirety of, of Israel. And as the priest stood before the mercy seat and the Shekinah's glory reflected in and through those stones, can you imagine what that light must have looked like cast around in the, in the most holy place? But each of those stones reflect the very same light, don't they? But it's going to look different. It's a different hue. And there are different personalities in God's church today. Uh, our ministers will take the same gospel that someone else just spoke on and diffuse it in different colors. And so when we're approaching the subject of righteousness by faith, by grace and by his, my faith, I pray that God will bring things to light that you and I need to hear and those that would be watching this later that would benefit them in their walk with Christ in their work of preparation. 
something, I'm not looking to recreate the gospel, friends. But because I am a different person than that person or that person, maybe there's something in my character and upbringing that will see certain aspects of this subject that might benefit us. Here's the quote. It's found in, uh, I want to go to a more, um, okay. Um, how about, well, Bible Commentary, Volume 5. And this is in page 1089.6. With the great truth we have been privileged to receive, we should, and under the Holy Spirit's power, we could become living channels of light. We could then approach the mercy seat. Where's the mercy seat? Above the Ark of the Covenant, which is in what apartment? In the most holy place. Okay, let's understand what we're being counseled here. We could then approach the mercy seat and seeing the bow of promise, kneel with contrite hearts and seek the kingdom of heaven with a spiritual violence that would bring its own reward. And I asked you, remember I asked you, are there things that we can believe in with certainty? Now in order to exercise this spiritual violence, which I'm not going to read the rest of the quote, um, I'll leave that for you, but this is the point I wanted to make. Like Jacob, friends, we're going to have to wrestle with God. We're going to have to. The Bible says we should not enter into heaven without much tribulation. Okay, there, there are trials for all of us, and those trials we already know, if you've walked any distance with Christ, are to purify us. But righteousness by faith. This is a subject that I want to open up, look closer at, understand the mechanics, and I, I'm a personality that wants to know why. Why does that happen? Whereas others might not even care and walk on by, not necessarily righteousness by faith, but things in general. So that's the mindset that I have as I approach this subject. And if you remember our last message, I'm looking at a quote of Sister White's that totally transformed how I look at righteousness by faith and overcoming sin. And yesterday, the, the part that I was sharing was dealing with all sin is what? Is selfishness. And we also were just beginning to break into the next part that I wanted to share. So I told you then I was going to back up just a little bit and recap, make those points again and move forward from there. So we were looking at not only is all sin selfishness, but what does selfishness lead to? It leads to self-exaltation. And the way that we see this manifested in our lives every day, remembering now, I, I read that to believe that, to, to lift ourselves above God, to say that we are greater than God, wiser than God, we are God, is not necessarily what you and I would identify each day. We don't think we do that. But the way that it's manifested in a practical sense that we can relate to is when we come to a situation where we have to make a decision for right or for wrong, we are going to, and honestly, every single thing in our Christian experience comes down to this one thing. God's will or my will. Everything about the gospel, about the great controversy, it comes down to the right to choose. Your will or my will. And this is where we see manifested Self-exaltation. Do you remember reading in, I believe it's the Desire of Ages, where Jesus is pleading with Satan to abandon his position, to seek forgiveness. And if you read those accounts, Satan was sort of like Nero. He was almost persuaded. But he had already told all these angels his pride made him go forward in his sin of rebellion against the God of creation in heaven. Do we have that problem? When you're confronted with your selfishness, your sin, are you blaming Eve? Are you blaming Adam? Are you blaming the serpent? You, just, you know what I'm saying? So the, the, the trial that we're all going to face every day in this journey of righteousness by faith 
is your will or God's will? Let's be clear, because if it comes down to it, that's what you're faced with moment by moment every day. Whether it be in your, in your driving, it be in how you're eating, your sleeping habits, all of these things are to be governed by whose will? The will of the Father. Now let me ask you, what is the will of the Father? What is it tangibly? You could see it. What is the will of the Father? The Ten Commandments. That's the will of the Father. And that's why the Bible says that to him that doeth his will will know of the doctrine. You can't be a student of the Bible and always come to right conclusions unless your goal, your desire, your journey each day, each moment is to obey our God in heaven. Our will or our Father's will, this is where our challenge is. So when we set our will ahead of or above God's will, what is that? That self-exaltation. That's what it is. Isaiah 14, you don't have to, you can go there, but I'm just going to reference here. We're kind of doing a little bit of a recap before we start jumping into Scripture again. But in Isaiah 14, we, we're reading about Satan who's brought low. Actually, there is something I want to point out there. So if you'll come with me to Isaiah. I, I realized yesterday I didn't get to this point. I was anxious to get certain things in place, and I actually reached into some material that we're going to share here again with more clarity, of course. But I, there's a point there in Isaiah 14. St let's start in verse 13, 12 actually. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And then there's the next verse. Because you remember in Isaiah, what we were dealing with at the beginning in chapter 2, everything that is high and lifted up in the day of the Lord, he's going to bring low, right? Remember that? I was, I was going through that part. So watch. He's identifying Satan, the characteristics of Satan, the spirit of the king of the north. And then this is what he says. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Or he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now I'm not, I was very tempted to, but I'm not going to go into in this message the more details about the king of the north. Uh, Pastor Taylor is doing a fantastic job and praise God for... Uh, each of us as living stones being used of God to bring different hues of the same gospel uh, before you. And so I, I'm just going to, I'm going to look at the spiritual aspect and I, wanted, I do want to say some things about it, uh, but I'm not going to get into a Bible study necessarily in depth about it. Um, let me just say this, sometimes when you are looking at a subject to consider whether it's truth or error, Friends, if you have how many testimonies, then it's established. So do I need to go through 50 references with someone who is really combative and doesn't want to consider? Nope. All right. So what I'm going to do is not necessarily the, the full gauntlet of the Bible study, but I want to set some things before you through the course of this study together through this week that would deny access for the error to come into our Christian experience if we're going to be honest as to what the scriptures are saying. Now, what I'm emphasizing here in Isaiah 14 that I didn't yesterday, Satan is going to lift himself up, has been since day one, but ultimately what does Jesus say will be the result? I'm going to bring you down. Because why in Isaiah 2? What's going to happen in that day? Only God will be lifted up. Only. That's the only one. And that's the only one that should be lifted up. We read in James 4.10 about how we're to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And He will lift you up. It's not about you lifting yourself up. Your opinions, your ideas, how you think you ought to eat, how you think you ought to sleep, how you think you ought to drive, how you think you ought to treat your spouse, how you think you ought to parent your child. God did not leave us to govern ourselves, did He? 
He at least gave us Ten Commandments, but praise the Lord, he gave us the spirit of prophecy and the health message, Adventist home, child guidance, all right? And so, praise the Lord, we have these things, but he's not left us to ourselves. Friends, our will, we know, needs to be submersed in whose? Now, you know, we have a term here on the earth called codependency, and that's not a good word. But I don't mind at all being codependent on my Savior. I want my life to revolve around Him. You know, in parenting, and parents might find this interesting, you, you, you probably already know this, but in the first three years of a child's life, the mother revolves, orbits around the child to all of its needs, all of its cares. From three years on forward, the child is to be taught to orbit around mom and to help mom, to serve mom. And our families today are so messed up because it's the other way around. Mom never stops orbit. She never comes out of orbit. They're 24 years old and she's still, in essence, changing their diapers, giving them money to pay their bills. You know what I'm talking about, and I don't need to go there. But the point is, is codependency, okay? Codependency on Christ is an, is an awesome thing, but not on one another. Because Christ and Christ alone is to be our Lord not the things of this world. So we're, we're dealing with self-exaltation right now. And uh, we read in 2 Corinthians about the casting down of everything that is exalted and lifted itself up. Then we went to Isaiah 2. We, we looked at everything, how God, everything at the end of the world, the, even the, the fenced cities, the high towers that are going to be cast down. We were just taking a glance at before we had to close that those things that are being, the, the, the high towers of Zephaniah at a spiritual level is representative of those things that we find security in. Now I'm going to revisit that just to make a couple of points after I read this quote I want to read to you. This quote I want to read to you is found in first uh, 1 SP, and I forgot what 1 SP, it isn't special, sermons, it isn't sermons and talks, but 1 SP 91.1 is where it begins. And this is what, the, this is what our, our prophet said. Some of the descendants of Noah, is it a spirit of prophecy? Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, spirit of prophecy, volume one then I would assume? Yes. Okay, page 91, paragraph one. Some of the descendants of Noah soon began to apostatize. A portion followed the example of Noah and obeyed God's commandments. Others were unbelieving, Watch this now, unbelieving and rebellious. And even these did not believe alike in regard to the flood. Some believed in the existence of God and in their own minds accounted for the flood from natural causes. Others believed that God existed and that he destroyed the antediluvian race by a flood and their feelings like Cain rose in rebellion against God. What's the two words you've heard that are identical in this thing so far? Rebellion. Okay. Does rebellion help uh, happen when we are submersed in the will of the Father? Okay. They rose in rebellion against God because He destroyed the people from the earth and cursed the earth with the third time by a flood. Those who were enemies of God felt daily reproved by the righteous conversation uh, and God lives of those who loved, obeyed, and exalted God. We know that uh, Pastor Chapman here on Monday was talking to us about the mouth, the power that the enemy has to exercise through our mouth that is unguarded. And here, those who were enemies of God felt daily reproved by the righteous conversation and godly lives of those who, who loved, obeyed, excuse me, and exalted God. The unbelieving consulted among themselves and agreed to separate from the faithful, whose righteous lives were a continual restraint upon their wicked course. If you don't think your lifestyle in your local church isn't having an effect, please reread this. Because your life is a letter that men are reading. And God is speaking to them through your lifestyle, just as he did through Christ, right? It's no different. As we live a righteous life among the ungodly, by the power of God's grace, amen, we are a letter that they are reading 
and that they are considering and the Holy Spirit is stamping upon their minds that they'll let them. The unbelieving consulted among themselves and agreed to separate from the faithful. Read that. They journeyed a distance from them and selected a large plain. Friends, is a plain a high elevation or a low elevation? So these people went down. They selected a plain wherein to dwell. They built them a city and then conceived the idea of building a large tower to reach unto the clouds, that they might dwell together in the city and tower and be no more scattered. You know what this is talking about. This is the Tower of Babel. All right? But there's some interesting things that she brings out here. They reasoned, watch this, that they would secure themselves in case of another flood, for they would build their tower to a much greater height than the waters prevailed in the time of the flood, and the world would honor them and they would be as gods and rule over the people. Let me ask you a question. What were they trying to protect themselves from? To secure themselves from, should it ever happen again? All right, it was the floods. What were the floods? What were they? Sorry? The judgments of God, exactly. So here, watch this. These were a people who were going to ascend above the judgments of God. They were going to put themselves in a position where they would be, they would not be affected by the judgments of God. Okay? They were rebellious. They were saying, I know better than God. I'm going to build a tower so high, I don't have to worry about his judgments. He won't be able to hurt me. And this is the work that Satan does in the hearts of many today. They build these high towers. So when we're talking about high towers, at one level of understanding, what we're to see is this is where people have built a false sense of security in something, in the works of man, in, in, in ministries, in, in other people, in organizations, in pastors, and elders, and whoever it is, a false sense of security that they feel will preserve them when the judgments of God begin to fall at the end of the world. This is a high tower. They exalted themselves against God, she says, but he would not permit them to complete their work. They had built their tower to a lofty height when the Lord sent two angels to confound them in their work. Lightning from heaven, as a token of God's wrath, broke off the top of their tower, and guess what? Casting it to the ground. Everything that is high lifted up shall be brought low. Thus God would show to rebellious man that he is supreme. So what I would, in Psalms 91, Psalms 91, verses 1 and 2, um, someone else brought these verses out as well. I, I remember hearing them. Um, but in Psalms 91, verses 1 and 2, this is what we read. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, I believe this was uh, Pastor Chapman dealing with the birds. In verse 2 it says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. Not myself, not my own cunning, not my tower that I've built, but He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Now, jump with me, if you will, 2 Samuel 22. Back up into 2 Samuel 22, chapter 22 of 2 Samuel. And let us read verse 3 together. 2 Samuel 22, 2, 2, 2, and verse 3. The God is of my rock. In him will I trust. <clears throat> he is my shield. And the horn of my salvation, my high tower. You see, friends, we can't put confidence in ourselves. And we're talking about righteousness by faith. And we're talking about sin. And we're understanding that all sin is selfishness, which leads to self-exaltation. My will above the will of God, of Christ. 
And yet Christ as our example in the garden said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. This is our plea. So the God, of my, the God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou saveth me from violence. Friends, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, thus the term and the purpose of a Savior. I, a Savior means that you can't save yourself. You couldn't have saved yourself. You would have perished. Um, reminds me of a flight in D.C. area years ago that went off the runway into the river. And it was heavily filmed and broadcast. There were people that, that, that one man in particular, gave his life to rescue others. Huh? I, I believe it was in D.C., up in uh, around Maryland, Baltimore, up in that area. I, it could have been. This was a number of years ago. But there was a man in particular that gave his life to save another woman. That they just thought for sure she was an older woman. And he lost his, no, he didn't lose his life. They thought he lost his life. The point is this, selflessness versus self-exaltation. We're talking about the journey of righteousness by faith. And when we're overcoming, we're overcoming because we have humbled ourselves. The Lord didn't have to break off the top of the tower. He didn't have to bring us low we are humbling ourselves before our Father in order that He may lift us up. And that lifting up is an exalting, a, a, a development of character that we so desperately need. Brother Bob, you had your hand. The high towers of the Trade Center didn't save anybody. There are, there are things that God wants to teach us in His Word, but the, the self-exaltation is the problem. Now, I, I want us to look at... Um, Psalms 48, go back to uh, Psalms 48. These were also employed elsewhere, praise the Lord, because repetition deepens the impression. But Psalms 48, notice the verses 1 and 2. Uh, Pastor Taylor last night was dealing with the king of the north and identifying from Scripture the true king of the north. But in Psalms chapter 48, verses 1 and 2, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. You see, there is a true king of the north, and he is to be praised, he is to be exalted in the way that we eat, the way that we, like, uh, that we live, the way that we speak, the, our posture towards people as we're speaking to them. Um, and I can't help but think... Actually, the thought left, so I can't think. <laughs> that thought went. I was, it was something in com connection with that. May the Lord lead. So, here we have a true king of the north. And if there's a true, there's a false. If there's a, a true Christ, there's an antichrist. Right? And so, what I'm wanting us to, to consider is that the true king of the north is going to be copied by a false king of the north. And the true king of the north, we want to look at some of the characteristics of. But in, I, in Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4, let's notice something concerning Nebuchadnezzar, I believe. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 29. We see, brother, I mean, we see Nebuchadnezzar, he's in the city, he's walking about, he's been warned, and yet... He says, it says, at the end of 12, of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Of where? Babylon. Babylon. The king spake and said. Who spoke and said? The king of what? Babylon. Where's Babylon? Is it a northern army or a southern army? Northern. So the king of the north is saying, is, this, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Wow. You just asked God to punch you right between the eyes. You just invited 
that casting down that he's promised to those that lift it up. And that's what we know happened. This is the true spirit of the king of the north that came into Nebuchadnezzar, that controlled Nebuchadnezzar. Do you think Nebuchadnezzar started this way? Did, don't we read about the things that, that he saw in Daniel as a boy? And the, and the testimony, remember we talked a moment ago about Daniel, about us being letters that are read of men. And we know the king, through, through the spirit of prophecy, what he saw in these young boys was impressive to him. And he pushed past that because his will took ascendancy over God's will. Now, I want to keep this personal. I don't want to get into doctrinal things so much as I want to bring this to the heart. I have a problem that you probably have, and that is, is that self wants to take the ascendancy all throughout the day. I don't like being crossed, or I should say self doesn't like being crossed. Self doesn't like to come up on the short end of the stick. Self doesn't like to be woken up when they're still sleeping. Self doesn't like a lot of things. But self loves to be petted and praised. <clears throat> so Nebuchadnezzar is lifting up himself, and the result we saw was the casting down of Nebuchadnezzar. But I want to read something to you in Great Controversy, page 50. And page 50, Great Controversy, page 50. And paragraph 1. Now, we're dealing with a history that we're all familiar with, but I want us to see something, because see, what we're looking at now, and so you understand why we're here, we've looked at sin is selfishness. Selfishness leads to self-exaltation, putting your will above God's will. We looked at the Tower of Babel and how this is exactly what they did. Babel, is that in any way connected with Babylon? Certainly it is, okay? It's a direct connection. To Babylon. It's a term to explain confusion, but also one of the characteristics strongly of Babylon and Babel was self-exaltation or the ascendancy above God and His standards, His law. So now we're wanting to look at something. We want to look at this quote here in Great Controversy, page 50, paragraph 1, and it's, we're going to drop in on a history of chapter 3 in the Great Controversy entitled An Era of Spiritual Darkness. And we're going to see the transition, it's going to speak about the transition of the true church that had become corrupt and become something else. All right? It says, this compromise between paganism and Christianity, is paganism uh, antagonistic against the gospel? Okay? Between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin, foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. The gigantic system, sorry, that gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power. Now let me just stop for a moment and qualify with you. What is the man of sin? What is the man of sin teaching? What, is, what do we understand the man of sin to be? She says, Rome. Antichrist, both of those are, are right. It's the papal power. It's the, the sea of Rome. It's, it's that vehicle, and this is, this is what I want you to see here at this point. When you go into Daniel 11, and I'm not going there, but when you go into Daniel 11 and you start reading the characteristics from verse 31 onward that are describing this power there is no power on this earth that has taught as its belief system that they are above the God Jehovah. Now, there are many nations that have lifted themselves up as the power of earth, but there is no power that has ever exalted itself specifically above the God of Jehovah. It, they just haven't. And so, notice when we read this man of sin, he is connected with, let me read this word again, the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. And then notice he, what he's connected with, that gigantic system of false religion. 
that is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the, th do we know someone else who wanted to seat themselves upon a throne? So, and it, we know that was Satan. Now we know how he wanted to do it. Now we know the masterpiece that he developed in order to do that, this man of sin, and it was through the papal power. It was through the Pope of Rome. A monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to God's will. No, his will. Not your will, but my will. Satan once endeavored to form a compromise with Christ. He came to the Son of God in the wilderness of temptation and showing him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, offered to give all into his hands if he would but acknowledge the supremacy of the prince of darkness. Christ rebuked the presumptuous tempter and forced him to depart. But Satan meets with greater success in presenting the same temptations to man, to Wesley. To secure worldly gains and honors, the church was led to seek the favor and support of the great men of earth. And having thus rejected Christ, she was induced to yield allegiance to the representative of Satan, the bishop of Rome. There you have it. That's the power. That's the papal see. This is the vehicle, the monument of his efforts to seat himself upon that throne that Pastor Taylor's been dealing with. So we're dealing with self-exaltation. You will not find another power on this planet in the past history or future that will exalt itself above the throne of God as the papal power has. Amen. Even in the day of Christ, when they crucified Christ, it was not from, from a religious perspective. They were a conquering power. And they snuffed out the life of Christ but they were not the religious entity that would audibly say, right out in their catechisms, that we are God on earth. There is no power, friends. And this is a characteristic of the king of the north. This is the ultimate example of self-exaltation, which is selfishness, which is sin. And does, isn't it fitting, quite fitting, that it all stems from the father of sin? the same power. But God has a solution, friends, and that's what we want to really talk about. Okay, so you and I, we have a problem with selfishness. We have a bigger problem if we don't even see it or admit it, but we certainly all have a problem with selfishness. Greater, smaller. So let's, let's face that fact, and then let's move forward and understand this solution that God has for this. I was reading a quote to you from uh, Workers' Bulletin, September the 9th, 1902, paragraph 3. And this is the latter part of it. I broke into it when we were talking about, all, she said, all sin is selfishness. She identifies this beginning with Satan in heaven and so forth. But this is what she says next. This is WB, comma, September 9, comma, 1902. Paragraph 3. God has a solution for my selfishness. He has a solution for yours. Are you excited about that? I certainly am. I certainly am because you know, you know how hard we've tried to stop something. To stop sinning is, is worse than trying to quit smoking. Much worse. Because it comes at so many levels in our life. But God has a solution. Let's notice what it is. She says, the design of the gospel is to confront this evil. The design of the gospel is to confront this evil. This evil is what? Selfishness. So the gospel is, is present to combat selfishness. Now that's fascinating. What is the gospel? You know Romans 1.16? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God, unto salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Friends, the gospel is the power of God that he has placed here upon this earth to combat sin 
Satan or selfishness and self-exaltation. God has a solution. Now that's what we want to begin to unpack as we move forward and, and really start to realize what God is doing. Now I want to just say this to you. The reason that I'm sharing what I'm sharing is because as I went through this, I got in real close to it and I could see how important it is that you and I become familiar with the machinery that God has built and placed within our reach to overcome sin once and for all. To make it a reality in your life. Do you want to overcome sin? That's where we began. Why do you want to overcome was also a question. But friends, we can overcome. And like Caleb said, we can take that nation. We can conquer. And we've got to believe that. Now, what's going to help us believe that is understanding what God's done to make that possible. I, um, I relate to it this way. Bob, he's ex-military. And I, I shared it with him in this way. Let's say that you're military. And your group, your, your platoon or your battalion or whatever the language would be, is going out on a mission, life or death mission. And they're a, they just put you in a platoon. You don't know who these men are, but your life depends on them. How comfortable are you going to be in feeling that you're going to come back alive? You don't know them. They don't know you. It's a very... But then you, you switch this up and you say, all right, now I'm putting you with these guys, and these guys you know intimately and personally, and you know what they're capable of. You know their consistency. You know their abilities very well. You've served with them for years. You've got that same mission. How much more comfortable are you going to feel? Assured are you going to feel that you're going to come back from that mission? See, Jesus wants you and I to become familiar with the components of righteousness by faith. The elements that he's put in place, and they are going to be, they're going to be terms that you're familiar with, but you may not have understood how they all interact and what it all funnels down to the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's look at what the gospel is. That would be my question to you. What is the gospel? And Paul here in 1 Corinthians spells it out too plainly to be misunderstood. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because when we understand what the gospel is, that's going to begin to open the door for us to understand the power that God has put in place to deal with sin and selfishness and self-exaltation which results in you being separated from God for eternity. Notice with me verse 17. Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect, for the preaching of what? Cross. Of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So the, the gospel, the power of God, as Romans 1.18 says, the power of God is the preaching of the cross. How is that powerful? When you're preaching of the cross, what are you preaching? Christ. You're preaching of what subject? What's connected with the cross? What theme? I should, might be a better word. Salvation. 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 Victory. Victory. Suffering. Suffering. The love of Christ. And let me put a scripture before you that will help you consider, for it is the goodness of God that leadeth us to repentance. All right? Do we see the goodness of God in the cross? All right? But we're wanting to understand the power that he's put in place to deal with selfishness. And what I just told you, for it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. You can't be lifted up and repentant at the same time. So it just stands to reason that by beholding the cross, something's happening there. But let's read a little further, drop into verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified. All right, this, it's the same as saying we preach the cross. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. But let me ask you something. I need to make this point with you, if I haven't already. At what point is Christ and the Spirit of God separated? At what point in time ever have Christ and the Spirit ever been separated? 
at his death. Now the reason I'm asking that this is because when the Bible is talking about Christ and the power associated with Christ, we're going to get into this a little bit more, and I've got to be careful because I would really like to jump into it now. It seemed like it would fit here, but I want to stay with the program. What I, so what I want to do is, let me see. Well, Lord, you tell me. Let's do this. I'm going I'm to touch on it, but we'll get into it further down. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 and 26. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is again wanting to teach us something. He's going to use marriage to do it, but I want you to see something. In verse 25, he's going to talk to the husbands, and he says, listen, husbands, love your wives. And friends, I must just pause here and just tell you that in learning about this selfishness that exists within me and how sinful it is, in my marriage, I find that if I go over the line, okay, because self says, look, all right, this is my half, that's your half, you need to fulfill your half, and I'll fulfill mine, but you need to fulfill your half. But Jesus says, you want me to do that with you? You you want me to do that with you? All right, I'm going to draw the line, and I fulfill my half, you fulfill your half. But Jesus, and we are the priests of our home, men, he crosses over that line. He wears that line out. It's obliterated by his foot traffic of constantly coming over the line to deal with me, his bride. All right, to help his bride closer to the line. Does that make any sense? So in the context of marriage, selfishness has no place. And that's what he's teaching me in our relationship. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, that's you and I, and gave himself for it. Now, let's notice why. I've said this so many times, but it's powerful. That he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church that is, with the washing of two things. By, of water, by the word. All right, so the word of God and the spirit of God are never separated. I'm just going to just touch on this and keep going. But you know that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But if you have a lamp and you have no oil, how much light do you have? So it's understood, this is my point, it is understood that when we're talking about Christ and the power that he has, the lamp has no light apart from the oil. The oil cannot give light without the lamp because the lamp is the vehicle for the light, the oil. And what my point is, is that when we're reading in 1 Corinthians about preaching the gospel of Christ upon the cross, the effect that this has is because Christ, the gospel, the word, the truth, is never separated from the Spirit of God. It's His, it's his office in Hebrews to wield the sword of truth to separate you from sin, to cut the natural heart of man and separate him from his sinful tendencies. So that's, what, that's a point that I wanted to make there. But let's look at something. We read, you and I, in the last time, that sin is the transgression of the law in 1 John 3, 4, right? Sin is the transgression of the law. But let's look at Romans 13. Let's look at Romans 13. And we're looking at the solution that God has put in place to counteract selfishness. So love and... Uh, for those that are filming, I, I will be going to the whiteboard here shortly, so y'all stay with me. Romans chapter 13. And notice verse 8. Now, sin is the transgression of the law, but watch this. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath what? He's fulfilled the law. Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So the transgression of the law is sin. So let me write this out. Sin equals transgression. All right? Then 
what is the fulfilling of the law? <laughs> so listen. When man sinned, we needed an advocate. We needed someone to pay this price, to offset our debt of sin. The only thing that could do that, that could cover that, is the, and I hope this is the right word, the, magnan, the magnanimity or magnanimity? Magnitude. No, it, it, it speaks to God's giving, selfless giving. In giving his son, he paid the debt by fulfilling the law. He offset the transgressions of man. And this is what I was talking about yesterday. When you take the scales of this world and you consider all the sin. So when, so when he went to settle accounts, the boundaries of those accounts included all sins past, all sins future, all sins of every man that would ever happen on this planet. And he had to say... But what do I have to pay that debt? Ah, oh, my son. And he gave his son. Now, his son had to cancel out the transgression, and he did it with love, which is the fulfilling of the law. He counteracted the work of the enemy through all the selfish hearts of this world, you and me included, by giving something that we are still trying to wrap our mind around. But this is the power of God. It is the power of God unto salvation. Okay? Now, I want to read further into this quote. But you know, Matthew uh, chapter 22, verse 40, talks about the, the Ten Commandments, and it breaks them down into two tables, if you will. So the, the law is about love. And if we're sinning, we're transgressing the law. But if we're loving, we're fulfilling the law. She goes on with that quote I began of God having a remedy. She goes on and says, As a remedy for the terrible consequences into which selfishness led the human race, God gave His only begotten Son to die for mankind. How could He have given more? Do you understand now? He couldn't have given more. Now, I made reference to this yesterday, but the reason why the angels could not give their life for you and I is because they are not love. They're in possession of it. It governs their life. They're submersed in it. The environment they live in is God's love. It's His power that sustains them and keeps them as everything. But they are not the creators of that. They are the possessors of it, which you and I can be as well. But it originates from one source only, and that being God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But it's God. God had to die. And you will, uh, we've already read one quote, I believe, that when Christ died upon that cross, the Father was there. That's, he was with Christ in that process. In fact, I'm, I'm really strongly becoming convinced, and maybe I'm wrong, and you can share with me evidences otherwise, but I don't know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are ever separated from one another. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't say anything apart from the Father. You read in John 16, the Spirit only speaks what Jesus, what He see, finds in Jesus. This, that, I never see a disconnect between the three. They're all three very much involved in your and my salvation. Praise, the Lord. Praise God. How could He have given more? And this is where we consider the scales. In this gift, He gave Himself. Quote, I and my Father are one. This is where we see Christ in the Father. I and my Father are one, said Christ. By the gift of His Son, God has made it possible for man to be redeemed and restored to oneness with Him. Now, I want you to consider something. To be restored to oneness with God. What does that look like? Are you impatient? Are you going to be fretful? Are you lacking faith? What is it to be one with God? I think of let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Is that being one with God? Absolutely. 
We know that this tabernacle is going to perish, but who we are is right here, formed through choices daily. That's to be preserved, to have a new tabernacle. Praise the Lord. In this gift, he gave himself. She says, by the gift of his son, God has made it possible for man to redeem, be redeemed and restored to oneness with him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then she says, love is the great principle that actuates unfallen beings. With amazement, the angels behold the indifference that those who have light and knowledge manifest toward a world unsaved. Wait a minute, you see what's happening? Why are you so indifferent to the souls around you? If you possess God's love, if you want to be one with Him, why aren't you seeking and saving the lost? Brother Howard's dealing with this. Pardon me. Okay. The angels are wondering why we aren't seeking and saving the lost. You, you claim to be loving the Father, but we see the, that same principle that actuates all unfallen beings. That's that power. They're in possession of it, but they don't create it. They are created beings themselves. She says, love is the great principle that actuates unfallen beings. With amazement, the angels behold the indifference that those have those who have light and knowledge manifest toward a world unsaved. The heavenly hosts are filled with an intense desire to work through human agencies, to restore in man the image of God. They are ready and waiting to do this work. The combined power of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is pledged to uplift man from his fallen state. Friends, this is a promise what I'm about to read to you. And this is pertaining to righteousness by faith. This is about overcoming sin. Listen, every attribute, every attribute, every power of divinity has been placed at the command. Remember spiritual violence? They take the promises of God by force. Has been placed at the command of those who unite with the Savior in winning men to God. You want to save souls? Start with your own. Get out and start talking to people. Start communicating the things that God would have us communicate to those who are about to be lost, to those who are about to perish. Oh, that all would appreciate the truth as it is in Jesus. Oh, that all would love God in return for the love wherewith He has loved them. If you love me, Sin has extinguished the love that God placed in man's heart. When did he place that love there? When did he place that love there? Well, in the beginning. And we're going to also address that, all right, later. She says the work of the church is to rekindle this love. The church is to cooperate with God by uprooting selfishness from the human heart, placing in its stead the benevolence that was in man's heart in his original state of perfection, end of quote. So what is the church to be doing? How are you going to rekindle this love if you're not in possession of this love? And we want to understand as we move forward you heard me read it, love is a principle. In fact, she says, love is the great principle that actuates unfallen beings. Love is the principle. It is the pulse of God through all creation. It's what sustains the stars, the moon, the sun, your breath, my brain processes right now. It is the love of God that does this, for it is the power of God, not just unto salvation. It is the power. She, the servant of the Lord said, love is power. And she goes on to describe its power. But if we want power, victory to overcome sin, in fact, it was Brother uh, Alfonso that shared with me this quote from uh, Messages to Young People, I believe it was, dealing with that very quote that, that helped me to understand the, the power that I'm missing in my walk with God. Okay, let's recap. So we want to overcome. The problem is we're all facing sin. 
we're learning that it's really selfishness. Not just self in general, but we're realizing that it's selfishness, which means a manifestation of self in the most ugly way. Between those that we know and love, it interrupts our ability to minister to those around us. It interrupts our ability to even be a useful tool for Christ in saving souls. There are people that are being laid in the grave today that will not have the opportunity to labor for souls. Our breath is a privilege, it's not a right. And God has extended this to us that we might labor for those souls as one who must give an account. But we're also to search our heart as with a lighted candle, she says. Is there selfishness in you? Is it selfishness in me? The thing that God, as we just read, that's the remedy for this selfishness. Get this now. The remedy for this selfishness is God's love. So if you're out here learning and studying the Bible and you're learning all these grand and spectacular truths and you can write them out, not just on one whiteboard today, but three whiteboards set together and you, you paint out this incredible line upon line and dare anybody think that I'm being critical, I'm just, this is a reality, I'm, there's no malice in what I'm saying, but if this is your place in life right now, and you can draw all of that out, but you don't understand the way of salvation. If your faith is so low that when a small crisis comes, you crumble, doubt God, fall away, you are out of balance. You're missing the components that God is desiring to instill in us. And it comes through His principle of love. The just shall live by there that works by love and purifies the soul. Ultimately, the, in this particular part, what I want to express is, is that sin and selfishness, certainly, the self-exaltation, the my will above God's will, is overcome through beholding Christ upon that cross in the writings of the Bible, in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy, by be spending that thoughtful hour with Christ, reflecting upon the goodness of God, and certainly, friends, prayer. You know, you'll notice that Jesus, when he was with his disciples, one thing he never did say, uh, guys, I'll catch up with you in a little bit. I'm going to spend some time in study, and I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with you. Or I'm really feeling a little, little disconnected from my father, not, not as strong, so I'm going to go spend some time in study. I'm not playing down God's word. I'm just showing you the order that our Savior, who's the pattern of all for us, what he chose, where he went. There's a time and a season for all things, Solomon says. But when it comes time to open your Bible and start reading, what is the first thing you do? You have to pray for the Spirit that's going to lead you into all truth. So ultimately, in everything that we're doing, we need to be praying more. Friends, as we move forward, I hope you're as excited about overcoming as I'm becoming because I'm realizing the power. I'm becoming acquainted with the power that God is giving to us and has given to us that is present with us that we might overcome. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, kneeling before you now in the wake of this meeting, I pray that your voice was heard, and I pray, dear Father, that we will take it to heart, that we will weigh these things against what we already understand. And may your Holy Spirit now accomplish his part, and that is to impress it upon the heart and bring conviction of where we need to make our changes. Dear Father, ultimately what we want is to walk with you in, in heaven. We want the mind of Christ. We want to overcome sin. And the enemy is bent on destroying our ability to believe that because without faith it is impossible to please him. Dear Father, we must believe. And Father, I personally want to just thank you before all the creation for those things you've put in place that I too can become an overcomer, that I can fulfill your invitation, that I can accept that and become truly an overcomer and finally, Father, to sit down beside you in your throne. And this is to be our reality. 
not a theory that's floating out there in Adventism and in Christianity, but Father, that it would become a reality that day by day we may breathe in the atmosphere of heaven, that we can say within our own heart, I am his and he is mine. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, for your mighty angels that are here. Continue to guide and bless each one of us to find you, Father, to hear your voice. And thank you for protecting our equipment. In Jesus' name, Father, I offer this prayer. Thank you. Amen.